Hello and welcome back to Geology. I am Robert Lopez and today I want to talk about streams and floods. Now a stream is channelized running water. And if you think about a channel, uh, here I have a channel in here and there are these banks would be on the side of the channel. You'd have the stream bed in here, water flowing in this channel. Uh, and then to remember to a geologist, uh, any, any channelized body of water that's running is called a stream. So rivers, brooks, creeks are all called streams to geologists. Now, uh, also, when, I, when, when streams flood, because that's one of the, the topics of this chapter, when, when streams will flood, uh, what will happen is that the load, so you, the streams are carrying something called load, and load is all the sediment, silt, sand, gravel, what a, a dissolved material is being carried by the river. But when the river floods, that material gets deposited, usually right along the, the bank. So the, 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 the stream drops the load right along the edges and makes these natural levees. So that's how these develop here. Uh, because we like to build our homes on the floodplains out over here, or on these natural levees, um, we need to build man-made uh, artificial levees to kind of uh, uh, increase the height of these. And we'll say more about these um, when we talk about floods. Now, let's look at how stream flow begins, right? So here we have some precipitation, and precipitation in the form of rain primarily, but uh, snow could occur, then we could get the snow melt. But what would happen is if the initial uh, flow, and so remember, uh, we're, we're looking at, at runoff, and runoff is that surface flow, surface flow. So we're, it's a surface flow. The runoff usually starts off in a sheet wash where there's, there's really no place for the water to go except for moving horizontally along the ground surface. At some point when you get more water, extra flow down here deepens the channel, which means you start making little small rivers called rills. Your book doesn't really mention these, but rills are the beginnings of channelized water. So you start channelizing the water. Eventually they kind of com come together. They start down cutting. And so remember at elevation, down cutting erodes the channel bed. Uh, steeper slopes means there's more down cutting. And all we're talking about here is we're cutting into the bed of the channel, cutting into the bed of the channel. So we're cutting it, making the, the channel deeper, making this channel, this bed deeper. And what will happen, these rills come together, eventually you'll, you'll get a, a trunk stream, which is mainly the mainstream, and then you'll have tributaries that'll contribute water to this mainstream. Now as we go along here, there's a concept of base level that's really important. All streams uh, uh, want to reach this base level. And base level is ulti ultimately the, the, the elevation of sea level uh, because you can't cut below base level. If you cut below base level, then the river can't flow out to the sea. So there's a limit. So at, at higher elevations, uh, there's more down cutting into the stream bed. But once you get down to lower elevations, note that I get these meanders because as I get closer to base level, to sea level, um, the river isn't cutting down as much, it's not cut, down cutting as much, it's more doing a lateral side to side erosion. Some of that energy is taken up in the, the meanders. We'll mention those as, as we go along here. Again, with base level, limit of down cutting. And this is figure 1410 in your text. And so at, what I have here, I'm, I'm showing a, a longitudinal profile. So this longitudinal profile. And what it's basically showing how streams change as they go from the headwaters to the mouth of the river here. At the headwaters, you're going to see a stage one stream. And stage one streams are younger streams. They, they, they have V-shaped valleys. Uh, other points I, I note over here, they're going to have a high gradient, which means they're steep. Think of this gradient as the rise over the run. So if we had a slope here, we would have this distance here. So this would be the, the rise, and this would be the run. So it's a rise over the wind. So it's basically how it describes how steep the slope is. And usually we do it in a number of feet elevation changes versus the distance in miles. So feet over miles. So, so let's say this point up here was a 4,200 feet. And this point down here was 2,200 feet. 
And let's say the distance between those two points were, were five miles. So this run would be five miles. Then my gradient for this stream is 400 feet per mile. So for every mile you move along this stream, you're dropping 400 feet, which is a pretty good gradient. And so remember with, with the stage one young streams, we're going to have the, the higher uh, 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 vertical erosion, which means there's down cutting. So there's more of that down cutting into its, into its stream bed there. And then uh, little to no floodplains, right? Little to no floodplains. The stream is primarily uh, more straight. The V-shape. Sometimes you may see a slot canyon. So slot canyons uh, uh, or, or the stair-step canyons occur depending on the rock type. Let's look at a picture here. So here's another example of that longitudinal profile. We're going from the source of the headwaters to the mouth of the river. Stage one streams are going to be up in the steeper gradient. And uh, it will see more of these V-shaped valleys. And some examples of these valleys, if the, if the uh, rock is relatively hard, you'll see a steeper slope. Uh, if it's softer, you'll see more, more slumping and landsliding. There'll be a wider valley. So here's kind of a relatively harder rock here. Uh, again, a V-shaped valley there. Uh, sometimes if you have a very hard rock, you'll get these near vertical canyons here. Uh, and so you, you'll, they're called, which are called slot canyons. So here's an example of a slot canyon, pretty steep in this uh, Navajo sandstone here. And then um, the staircase uh, where you have differential weathering, right? So more resistant rock and like a sandstone or limestone shale. Shale would erode more easily, so you get these slopes. So like the Grand Canyon, you have this sort of staircase. The, the shales are, 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 are weaker, so they have the, the gentler slopes. The limestones and sandstones are harder, so they have the steep slopes. And then uh, the other thing about um, higher stage one streams, they're going to have a lower discharge. We'll talk more about that. And basically, it's, it's uh, uh, less volume. There's less water up there, right? Uh, so there's going to have a, a, a smaller amount of discharge. Uh, we'll, we'll say more about that in a little bit. Now, the next stream, as you're going down into these uh, sort of middle areas of the, of the longitudinal profile, we're going to see these stage two streams. And what these guys are going to have is note that we're going to have a stream meander. So right away, we're going to see that our down cutting isn't as strong, the vertical erosion. We're going to see more of this lateral side-to-side -side erosion creating these meander belts, right, a meander belt. And note that in a stage two stream, the meander belt is as wide as the valley. So uh, the, the regions outside of the valley, the stream valley, are called uplands. So we have these high uplands for stage one streams. And then the uplands here uh, are not as high, but they're still called uplands here. And then there's also these oxbow lakes. And all, you know, eventually these meanders kind of pinch out and we abandon parts of the channel. We make these oxbows. We'll talk about how those form in a little bit. And so another few points about the stage two streams. They're going to have a moderate to low gradient. So they're going to be probably less than 100 feet. Usually they're around 10 feet, 10 to, 10 to 15, 10 to 20 feet. Uh, meander belt as wide as a valley, so that's what I just showed you there. The presence of oxbow lakes, you're going to have a floodplain, and you're going to have this higher lateral erosion, that side to side because of those meander belts, right? So going back here, we can see that our meander belt is as wide as our valley. And so these, these, these kind of areas I colored in in, in in a darker color are the floodplains. Now for stage three streams where you're getting really low gradients or almost you're almost at base level so you're really not cutting down very much so you're going to have a high degree of lateral erosion side to side erosion but the key thing about the stage three streams is that they're they're going to have a meander belt uh, here but the valley is much wider than the meander belt right the valley is wider than the meander belt so we'll put an upland over here so here's an upland Here's a valley, but you can see the meander belt doesn't extend all the way across the valley. The other thing that we'll have here is we'll have a, a bayou, or, or sometimes they're called back swamps. And so uh, the swampy area will have their own rivers, and these are called Yazoo tributaries. The Yazoo tributaries are creeks, streams that parallel the main river, main stream, but eventually join it somewhere down the line there. And so those are, uh, so like the Mississippi is a good example of a stage 
three stream, the Missouri River would be a good example of stage two, and then the Colorado River, obviously a good example of stage one. So looking at some points for stage three stream, here we'll say that the, the valley wider than the meander belt, very low gradient. Usually they're less than a foot per mile. So again, we're going to have that, that high degree of lateral erosion. We're going to have those oxbow lakes, the bayous or back swamps, Yazoo tributaries, and remember that these streams are near base level. Now another topic that we discuss are these drainage basins and divides. And so with a drainage basin, uh, it's, it's the area that the main trunk stream and all its tributaries drain. Sort of, you can think of it as a watershed. So here I have two streams. And so the way we would draw these out, we would want to make the, we would draw in the, the watershed or the drainage basin. So uh, anything that falls in this region here will end up coming out of this main trunk river. For this one, I would draw another drainage basin watershed so anything, so if any if water fell in here, it'd end up going into this drainage basin. If it fell in here, it'd go into this drainage basin. So this line that I've drawn right here that separates the two drainage basins, that's called the divide. So a divide separates drainage basins. Let's look at an example of that. So here we have some drainage basins and divides. So here we can see there is a, a, a stream here and another stream here. So this ridge top right in here would be the divide that separates this drainage basin from that drainage basin. So you can see the little dividing of the two uh, drainage basins there. Uh, here's an image of, of drainage basins in North America. And so uh, you can see the Mississippi River drainage basin is a very enormous, pretty huge drainage basin. And then this would be the continental divide right in here, which separates uh, waters that go into the Mississippi drainage basins from those of the Snake River, Columbia River, or the Colorado River down here. And then we even have the Rio Grande Basin in here as well. There's a Red River in, in Texas as well. Here is a drainage basin showing the, the watershed for the Great Amazon River. Our drainage pattern. So the, the, and this is when you're looking at a topographic map. And when you see a certain drainage pattern, you can say something about what type of bedrock underlies this drainage pattern. So this first one is called dendritic. And dendritic is kind of like the veins on a leaf and uh, as these tributaries uh, join each other. And so usually what's happening with dendritic drainage patterns is you're draining homogenous rock. In other words, it's all the same. It's either all granite, all metamorphic, all sedimentary, it's the same. So, so if it's sedimentary rock, then you're probably looking at flat strata, uh, relatively flat strata. Uh, if it's uh, igneous rock, you're probably looking at just one granitic rock type, one type of igneous plutonic rock type, uh, or metamorphic for that same reason. Once you start seeing changes, you'll, you'll start seeing this pattern called, called trellis. And the trellis pattern here involves heterogeneous rock, where it's mixed. And usually it involves folded strata, where you have more resistant sandstone layers and, and weaker shale. So the shale layers, because they're weaker, that's where the valleys will be. The streams will occur in the valleys. So you'll see a series of parallel streams. They may join later on uh, down, down, down slope, but you'll have these, these parallel streams uh, and indicative of this heterogeneous or folded strata. When you see uh, a radial pattern, a radial pattern involves streams all leaving the center point. So obviously you have some sort of hill, mountain, volcano. And then rectangular. So for a rectangular pattern, you'll see a series of parallel streams similar to the trellis. However, these join at right angles. See how they're joining at right angles? So we'll put 90 degrees here. Uh, and this means that the rock must be fractured. There's heavily jointed, uh, uh, probably a limestone or a heavily jointed uh, sandstone, sort of like Arches National Park, and they're joining at these right angles for fractured rock. And then uh, the last one your book mentions is this parallel. And so here we have some uniform, str uh, uniform slope. Mm -hmm.